The greatest power you possess is your ability to choose. Join Lowe's Moore as he reveals how you can begin to maximize that power by exploring yourself on the deepest levels and committing to making lasting and positive changes. Get ready to achieve breakthroughs that will lead to accelerated growth and transformation because you are now tuned in to The Blueprint. Good evening, this is Lowe's Moore, and I want to welcome you back to The Blueprint Podcast. Man, let me see. I'm excited here. I think I got a little camera problem. Uh, uh, well, you can hear me. Uh, we 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 having a little camera problem here. Uh, and we'll get it straightened out. But I want to talk to you anyway. I want to say uh, again, welcome back to the Blueprint Podcast with Lowe's Moore. Um, I hope you guys had a wonderful week. Man, hasn't it been amazing um, uh, this week? Uh, man, it almost seemed like uh, we are in, like it was spring this week. Uh, I've talked to a number of people, uh, you know, particularly yesterday, I want to say congratulations to Pastor Pogue um, of the Greatest Centennial Church, uh, Amy Zion Church. And he, he was celebrating his 10th anniversary uh, celebration on yesterday luncheon. And let me tell you something, it, it was it was an awesome time and it was a beautiful day. Actually, it was a beautiful week, you know, uh, and and and, you know, when you have an uh, amazing a uh, week like we had, uh, you know, I, I'm like, look, uh, I'm just saying, uh, I think we have to. We're gonna have to move that camera a little. Yes. So, yeah, we're good. We're all excited. Had a little temporary, uh, you know, confusion here, but we all good right now. Uh, but again, let me get back to this um, this weather, man. I, you know, been out walking. You know, having a great time during the course of this week. Um, hung out with my wife all last week. Uh, got a chance to to go up to uh, Syracuse um, last Sunday, hung out with some good friends, man, got up on Monday, man, we got a chance to go to see Syracuse play. Uh, my guest tonight is, an, uh, unfortunately, an avid Syracuse fan. Um, he actually graduated from Syracuse. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, but hey. I was up there and I had a chance to see my daughter and her husband who coaches for Stony Brook um, yeah, play against the Syracuse women's team. Um, yeah, I, I was kind of split, you know, because my cousin, uh, you know, played for Syracuse, uh, one of the best players there. Uh, she was doing her thing. We was hoping that, that she didn't get on fire. Uh, Tisha Hyman. Um, we was hoping that she didn't get on time, you know, but I was excited, man, just to be to be in Syracuse and to hang out there. It was beautiful weather, you know, and man, you know, what is the world coming to? Let me let me let me let me tell you this this real quick. I was hanging out with my my friend we stayed with and he was like beautiful, beautiful home way out in, in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and I want to give a shout out to Ed Cheatham and his wife, Cynthia. I want to get a shout out to them, man. Thank you for, you know, housing us for, but man, he had a, he had a guy next door, his next door neighbor. I mean, which is a little ways away. And we got up in the morning. He said, you want to see something? I said like, yeah. He said, look out that window. He said, my neighbor has, he don't come out and cut his grass. Now I cut my grass. He said, man, Look out there. You see that thing rolling around out there? It, it looked like a little miniature car or tank. It was it wasn't it was huge. It was actually big. And he said, it cuts that guy's grass. I mean, every time that grass go down <laughs> a little bit, that them little cars come out and just start roaming around and cutting the grass. And I was like, what is the world coming to that we can't get out and cut our grass? You know, but 
hey, I, I don't seen everything. Like you, you got the little sweepers in your house where, you know, you just touch the button, they pop out and they go in there and they vacuum your, uh, they vacuum your floor. He had it in his yard. I mean, like, come on now, <laughs> that's ridiculous. But uh, I enjoyed myself up at Syracuse and then uh, went back to the back to Albany. Me and my wife hung out for the uh, she's on assignment up there. Uh, we hung out until Friday. We literally came back home on Friday. We just hanging out, uh, having a great time. And and the weather was beautiful. So, hey, no, no, no complaints, you know. Um, and hey, you know, I hope you guys enjoyed the weather. You know, we know it's not going to stay like that, but you know, again, welcome back to the blueprint, man. I love you guys. Let me get started, man. I'm going to drop my, this is, this is my pebble in the pond. It looks like a little basketball and and it is, I drop it every single week. I'm dropping it because I'm expecting a ripple effect of the show. Somebody's going to be impacted. Um, I guess is amazing. Uh, somebody's going to be impacted by this. Somebody's going to gain some knowledge. Uh, remember, we stay on, you know, so once once the show is over, you can continue to watch it. Again, we're on Facebook uh, on the Blueprint and we're on YouTube uh, on the Blueprint. And if you don't mind uh, on YouTube, if you would just go and just subscribe, uh, you know, help us to continue to grow and and build the show and uh i appreciate it uh just want to say thank you and and so let's get rolling here i have my book of the week yeah there it goes i'm trying to see uh uh you know this this i, I actually have this book you know and and you know i went through it when it when it first came out, I went through it, and and it's uh it's called the devotional for for busy busy people, right? Uh, but the name of the book is Point Me in the Right Direction, devotional for busy people, and you guys always hear it uh, by by Larry D. Woodard, um, and and you know I explain that a little bit more later. But you need to get this book. If you're busy, you need to get this book. And you, you, you know, every week I give the book of the week and I give an affirmation or uh, for the week. And it's important. It's important that you get up in the morning. It's important that you that you start your morning off because sometimes we're turned on the television and everything is just negative. And all of a sudden it changes your frequency and your vibration. And next thing you know, you're moving in fear rather than moving in faith. Right. So when you get up in the morning, I always say, look, man, pull out uh, for me. I pull out my Bible. I pull out my scripture. I got to say a prayer. You know, I got to get something that's going to shift me uh, from a from a fearful mindset into a into a faithful mindset every single morning without without a doubt. I, I got to get up and and train. I train myself to move, move my mindset from something negative into something positive. And. And, and this is a great tool right here to get this book by Larry D. Wooded. And, and, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. But here's the word of the week. That's the book of the week. And now the word of the week. And you, you guys know I started a couple of weeks ago with the fruit of the spirit. Right. And. And that the fruit of the spirit is love. And then there's some attributes of love. And I've been pulling them out one at a time. Uh, the first one I pulled out was love. And then I pulled out joy. And this week's word of the week is peace, right? Nothing's more powerful than having peace, man. I, I, I mean, you know, in the, in the society, in the world that we live in, man, everybody, every day, is trying to find some peace right and 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 uh it's a powerful word man that we all need to recognize when we are not in that state of peace and when we need to to use the tools i just said earlier uh with uh larry d wood's book his devotional you know we got to find tools that are gonna that are gonna bring peace into our lives 
right? And and that's a very powerful word. And we want to stay in peace every single day. And then check out this. Check out this affirmation, this Hill Harper, Pierce Harper affirmation quote moment, right? Check this out. It says, the greater the variety of experiences you have in life, the more you have the potential to learn, right? The greater variety of experiences. You got to have experiences. It's impossible not to have it. If you're not having an experience, you're in trouble, right? But if you if, if you having a variety of experiences, then what happens is the more you learn, right? I always say they, I call them tests. The more tests you have, the more you learn, the more you grow. And that's those tests that help to, are to help you reach your full potential, right? And 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 so uh, don't don't forget about don't forget about the affirmation every single day. And then look we, later on coming across the screen, we're gonna have Larry Larry D Woodard. Um, we're gonna have Larry's uh, information up there so you can get that book, right? Uh, so you can read something every day that can shift your mind from fear, from fear to peace. Right. And so, and then here's my music, my music and my movie of the week. All right. Now, I don't know if you guys remember, um, uh, take six, right. Uh, back in the day, long with the right after first it was Andre Crouch and then it was the whinings right and then all of a sudden after the whinies you know take six comes on the on on the scene uh kind of re, you know kind of remind you like uh the, uh the gospel or christian boys to men right that that harmony that they had was just truly amazing right and and uh if you haven't heard take six you 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 know especially for you young i call generation z right you and generation z you probably haven't heard take six right but if you want to hear something some real good music uh some real good faith music check that out that's going to be good and then the movie cars right and there's a little methods to my madness here but um i, I was showing my uh grandson uh about a month ago i put on cars and he was like cars 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 yes yeah truck yeah, truck buzz, you know, like that is a good teaching tool, right? And and uh, you know, that's 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 an awesome movie, uh, something that your kids can learn, and even adults, man. I you know, I used to use take I used to use cars at the boys and girls club as a teaching tool. Many of these, many of these animations are teaching tools. Now they won't listen to you just stand in front of them like I'm doing right now, just stand in front of you talking. But if you put if you put something on, they can see, right? And then all of a sudden you can put it in parts, right? And you can pull something out of each one of those parts that you can teach them. They will learn something. They will learn faster and they will learn greater. So that's my music of the week and my movie of the week. And hey, I got a few shout outs right here, right? Um, my sister-in-law, Gwen, it's her birthday. I want to say happy birthday to Gwen, man. You know, Gwen's from my Vernon, both my brother, uh, who, who married Gwen, they live in Fayetteville, North Carolina. I want to say happy birthday, man. You know, Gwen is gifted, man. I, she's creative. I mean, there's nothing that she can't do or create, right? always get a pleasure going down and whenever I have an opportunity to go down in Christmas to see her put up the, the, the decorations because it's like perfect. You know, the things you see in the magazines, you know, uh, in terms of decorations, I, I go and I'm amazed. I like my tree don't look like that, man. I got to get somebody already to set my tree up and just put it up. Right. So I can just take a look at it, but she just puts that stuff together, man. And it's beautiful, you know? So Gwen, I want to say happy birthday to you and uh god bless you and then my brother curtis and his wife carla they're celebrating their anniversary i want to say happy anniversary to you guys love you guys uh amazing right many many more years right and uh i love you and and so let's get moving forward right let, let me show you this highlight here and then we'll get right into the show 
Nod from her and your book can become a bestseller. Your product can fly off the shelves. Your movie can open at number one. But can Oprah determine who sits in the Oval Office? Here is how she responded to a question from Larry King about a man who wants her to run for president. I would say, take your energy and put it in Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. That's what I would is say. Is that your favorite that guy? That would be my favorite guy. Are Do you that? still an Illinoisan? Yes. So even though you have a home in California? Yes, I'm very much an Illinoisan. So Senator Obama is your senator? He is my senator. Yes. That's and your choice. And my choice. And Thank I would you hope all. that he would run for president. <laughs> There you have it. Joining us now from New York is Larry Woodard, president and CEO of Vigilante Advertising, whose company was responsible for the infamous Oprah car giveaway. Welcome to you, Larry. Thank you. So everybody who's in the audience that day that Oprah gave a car to, everybody who wishes that they were there that day, are they all going to go out and back Barack Obama now, do you think? Well, you know, quite possibly. I mean, you know, I call Oprah the friendly iconoclast, which just means simply that uh, she's able to uh, sort of upset the apple cart and put things on the national agenda uh, in a friendly way so that when she puts it on the agenda, it's on the agenda. Do you think Oprah can do for uh, Barack Obama what she has done for countless books and, and products and holiday gifts and things? Well, that remains to be seen, and it also remains to be seen whether or not um, she's just merely putting it on the agenda that shouldn't we broaden uh, our, our conception of who can be president? Shouldn't we broaden our conception of who should be considered when we start to think about the highest office? I mean, are we looking at the entire talent pool or are we just looking at, uh, at, at a certain segment of the, of the talent pool? I think that Oprah and her influence on popular culture certainly has the ability to open up that dialogue. Let's talk about that influence because it is enormous. What is the key to her influence? Well, the key to her influence, uh, from my perspective, are, are really several, several factors. One of those, and probably the most important of which, is she's just believable. She really talks to her audience. Um, she doesn't talk at her audience or down to her audience. She doesn't seem to have another agenda. Her agenda seems to be pure. She seems to, like uh, at one point the Democratic Party was for everyone else. And I think that, uh, that Oprah really gives a voice to a lot of people who have an opinion but don't really feel like they have a voice. All right. Larry Woodard, president and CEO of Vigilante Advertising, thank you so much. <laughs> Welcome to the Blueprint Podcast, my good friend, Larry Woodard. Hey, Larry, what's up, man? Hey, man, it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> oh, real quick, I want my wife to pop them. There's some pictures there. Uh, see if she can pop them back up there real quick. Uh, you know, uh, I, I was fascinated by, you know, going through your pictures and stuff. And um, I, I don't know. She, I think she may have uh, disappeared, but for a second. But he, check this out. Vintelange uh, advertisement. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what was what, what was up with the name? <laughs> well, um, you know, advertising is is more interesting than people know. Uh, I think at that time. Uh, they had figured out that um, that less than one percent uh, of executives in advertising were black. Less than one percent, you know, virtually nobody. And right. uh, so when we, um, you know, started Vigilante, the tagline for Vigilante was "Find a way or make a way." And we really thought that we had to be aggressive, not for the consumer who were already consuming things but for the industry to be able to get into the industry and do the things that we knew what we could do to, the, you know, to sell business. Right. And, and, um, you know, we, while we work on some camera issues here, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I mean, but that whole thing with Oprah, um, and for, first talk a little bit about that, the whole car thing and how that came about. Yeah, very interesting, you know, and, uh, you know, like, uh, and I'm sure we'll have plenty of time to talk about, um, you know, our shared faith. But, you know, I'm a, I'm, I'm a guy that just um, really is, uh, is fueled by faith. And I had a, um, a, cre a chief creative officer. His name was Danny Robinson, extremely talented guy. And uh, Danny uh, was one of the founders of Vigilante. And he left. He left to go to the Martin Agency, where he's now. He runs the Martin Agency. 
And uh, he, um, as, as a matter of fact, one of his uh, his great successes of late is the Scoop There It Is commercial. That's Danny Robinson. Oh, oh Scoop? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, but Danny is, uh, is, is super talented. And so Danny was coming on to, um, you know, uh, Danny left the agency uh, after 9-11 and uh, the blackout and all that stuff happened. His kids were really having some issues and he didn't necessarily feel you know, they didn't feel safe in the, in the Manhattan area. So he moved back down to Virginia, where he's from, went to work for the Martin Agency. And so we're without a creative director. And so, you know, we I'm doing a nationwide search trying to bring in a creative director, uh, preferably somebody of color. I, I did find somebody, but we're running. So we're without a creative director and we need to do advertising for the new year for, for General Motors. And, uh, and it was scary. You know, and so so I, you know, I'm a creative guy, even though I was running an agency. So I got back into doing some of the creative. And one of the things that I had the company do was I wanted people to come in to the office a different way every every day. I said, if you come into work one way, come in a different way. I want you to write in these little books and I want you to help me understand what's out there, what what's what's out there that really people are listening to and paying attention to. And uh, one of my employees, Rochelle Blygen, said we ought to do something with Oprah. Because every way I come in, Oprah's out there. And you remember at that time, you know, David Letterman was begging her to be on the show and the beef guys were fighting with her on the network and just everywhere you looked, and she was doing her most favorite things. And just Oprah was really, really powerful everywhere. And then through um, a series of events, you know, um, I met her and Gail King and had a chance to, 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 to help them out when they were coming back from France to get their phones working. So I had both their, their emails, right? And right. Uh, so I approached them and said, hey, look, um, we'd love to do something with General Motors with you guys. And it was hilarious because Gail said, wow, and she was real interested in pursuing. And Oprah said, that don't even make any sense. How, how are they going to give away all those cars? <laughs> you know, she immediately was like, um, yeah, I'm not so sure. And so we were able to send the, the corporate jet uh, from, from General Motors, get her over to GM and uh, to help have her understand we were very serious. And at that point, Oprah took over because she was like, you know, uh, her first show, uh, she said, I don't want to do my favorite things because my favorite things are stuff that I really know about and I find during the year. But she said, this is big. I want to open up my show. I want to do the season opener with this. And uh, so she just got into it, understood it. A lot of the beauty of how it was done, you get a car, you get a car, it came from Oprah, you mm -hmm. know, but, um, you know, we met, uh, we talked, um, we found the idea intriguing and she made it bigger than even we thought it could be. Mm. And so over 200 and some people walked out with a brand new car. Yeah. And you know that um, as I was reading in a, in a magazine um, uh, that a professor in Chicago is quoted as saying that that was the biggest single day promotion in the history of advertising. Right. And that was really exciting to me. And, and so since then, you know, um, now that it's part of the popular culture, I've seen it. I mean, within two weeks of it happening, uh, we were getting calls from all over the world. You know, I mean, I'd wake up and there'd be a call from Good Morning America or a call from The Wall Street Journal, somebody like that that just wanted to talk about it and where it came from and how big it was. And and obviously it put our agency on the map, gave us the opportunity to do some great work for some great big clients and uh, and really sort of propelled my career in a way that nothing else I think could have. And that happened all out of we should have been scrambling. We should have been failing because we didn't have a chief creative officer. But instead, you know what they say, but God. You yeah, know, we, we really took off and, uh, and had the best period of our, uh, you know, of our lives. Yeah. And that's that's why it's important. I mean, in terms of the blueprint. Uh, and that's why you see at the top there, it says uh, lifestyle, seven spheres of influence, because any one of us could be gifted in any sphere of influence. Uh, and sometimes we take for granted, you know, particularly if you find yourself, uh, um, you know, in, you know, in that sphere of religion, right? And, or religion, spirituality, faith, uh, you find yourself there. And then sometimes, you know, we we don't get an opportunity uh, to minister outside of that sphere. You know, we think that, you know, the, the most important thing is just that sphere of influence, just being in the church, just being in the four walls. When uh, the scripturally it says, Jesus says, in, in, 
you know, in in in, in the New Testament, go. He didn't, he didn't say come. I think we go to church to be equipped, use our gifts and talented to go our gifts and talents to go into a sphere of influence in which you did, right? You going in the sphere of business, finance, marketing, that that whole sphere of influence, and uh, which is you said you just meant and look what God did, <laughs> right? Yeah, and that that's absolutely true. You know, when you are your authentic self. You know, God makes a way for your ministry. And I felt, as you know, for a long time that um, that that's the mission field. I mean, when you start to get to guys who are billionaires, the guys who have these huge companies, they have problems, too. And they find out they hit the wall and find out their money doesn't solve their problems. And it's very unusual to have somebody there that can minister to them. And I've found throughout my career that those ministry um, times happen and they occur naturally or in a really strange fashion. You know, sometimes, you know, you get a call from a client and you don't even know the client knew you were a Christian. You don't even know the client knew you were a person of faith. And then in their crises, they call you and they they divulge that they were watching your walk. And then you're mm -hmm. able to, to, you know, to, to minister. And that's, um, you know, that, that, that that's a wonderful thing. Right. Uh, we're going to digress for a moment, but I just seen on the screen, you see, uh, you just see at the bottom of the screen, uh, was it Maxine and, and Janelle? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, was on that show and got cars. I mean. Yeah. The excitement level that she created was crazy. You know, like <laughs> some of my people were at the show as well. And, and she, she had told people that there would be boxes and that one person would get a car. Mm -hmm. so people were like looking for that key in their box so that they could be the one person who got a car. Right. <laughs> and then um, when they opened up the box, everybody realized everybody had a key. And she just started screaming, you get a car, you get a car, everybody gets a car. <laughs> and, um, and the wild thing about just how exciting that was is that, you know, just what happened. And I remember um, once somebody sent me um, a couple of years later, a birthday card that Hallmark had done. And it said, you get a card, you get a card, everybody gets a card, right? And we just started seeing it all over the place. And um, then other talk show hosts. And I was in, um, I used to be in the building with Rachel Ray. That's where my offices were when I first started this company. And I was talking to Rachel Ray and she was doing a big giveaway. And I couldn't even get into the office because they had bought in all kinds of stuff. And she had a giraffe on the show. And I was talking to her and she said, well, you started it. You started all this stuff, you know. <laughs> that was really fun. Oh man, that's great. <laughs> As we digress for a moment, man, we want to find a little bit about who Larry D. Woodard is, and I want you to go back and think about mom, dad, siblings, and 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 work your way up currently, right? Because uh, you know, part of the show is uh, about the importance of family. Yeah. Right. And we're just we've just been talking about faith and 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 education. Right. So there's three main points that I try to get, um, you know, everybody to have a conversation about importance of family, importance of faith, importance of education. So let's let's yeah, just let yeah. it go. Yeah. And, and it's interesting because for me, they all fit together, you know, perfectly. You know, um, having the opportunity to, uh, you know, to, to be a deacon and to, and to work in the church. Um, one of the things that I always do whenever we get sidetracked, you know, as churches, we might get together as deacons or what have you. And we might think that the, there are things in the church that are important to do. And we get too wrapped up in that. And I always bring people back to the fact that there's somebody out there that needs us. There's somebody that's out there that needs for us to hold our light up, shine our light, do what we're supposed to do, reflect, um, you know, Christ. And when I was a kid, you know, seven, eight, nine years old, um, my dad and my mom were not saved. And we had a, a rough household. You know, I mean, my dad was drinking, you know, he'd come home, you know, there were fights in the house. There was noise in the house. There was a lot of stuff that was, um, you know, you couldn't see us going in the direction that our family went in. And I have an older brother, James, and James um, went to the church, but he went to the church because of the church outreach. The church had donuts <laughs> on Sunday. The church gave comic books. The church had stuff that was interesting. 
you know, so he went to church and he compelled us to go. He took me. It was easy because I wanted to be everywhere he was as my older brother. And then he got my mom to go. And then he got my dad to go and the rest of the family went. And I, I'd say within a year of that time, my dad got baptized, you know, and um, then started working in the church. And I think he became a, he was an usher first and then later on became a deacon, the chairman of the deacon ministry eventually. But to me as a kid, it seemed like everything right started as soon as they got on the right track. Mm-hmm. You know, like we were we were in a um, in a family where. You know, dad had a temper. These things were going on, military family, and he was a military guy. You know, all those things are happening. And then all of a sudden, we're going to Sunday night service. I love <laughs> Sunday night service. You know, it's like <laughs> 8, 10, 15 people there, and you pick out your favorite <laughs> hymn, people would sing it, and then we'd have refreshments afterwards. And people were showing us the love of God and talking to us about how you 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 do it. And it wasn't... Um, It wasn't conventional. I mean, I was my dad was a military guy and I was born in Casablanca, Morocco. Uh, Then after Morocco, you know, I'm five, six years old. We moved to Germany. We were in Germany for four years. And so we're we're over in places where there weren't these traditional places like, you know, Mm -hmm. we were we were at the chapel. But there were people there, Chaplain Curry, who just had the love of God. And he Mm -hmm. really reached out. And uh, once we got in, he put his arm around my dad. And, um, you know, we got into good Bible study and we were there Wednesday night. And, you know, then uh, throughout our lives, we would be at military bases or we'd be off of military bases. Like in, in Italy, we were in, in a place called um, Martina Franca, where we're in the heel of the boot out there in the middle of nowhere, one of only a few families. And every Wednesday we had prayer meeting with our family. We'd all get together. You know, that's how I learned to play the guitar. We we we'd do that. We worship. We pray. You know, and um, and so that faith piece, uh, I looked at that as like a blessing. Like some people look at Christmas and Christmas presents. Once we got faith in our household, things turned mm-hmm. for the better and they just never stopped. We, you know, we start understanding what prayer was about and understanding how to how to support one another and getting into churches and growing up that way. Um, so that's that's just inextricably linked with everything that that, that I've done. But uh, my life is, you know, military brat. You know, military brat. We lived in, uh, in Italy. We lived in Germany. You know, we lived in Morocco. You know, so we lived a good, um, you know, 10, 12 years overseas. Mm. And then um, we would, um, you know, come back here every three, four years for a little bit. Um, so here we were in um, New Mexico. We were in Oklahoma. We were in South Carolina. And um, growing up that way, you um, Two things are occurring because this is, um, you know, mid 60s to you know, to the late 70s, where, first of all, there's a lot going on from a, a racial standpoint in places. And largely we were away from that. You know, so largely we'd be in places where where white people and black people had to get along because the, the U.S. government, uh, from a military standpoint, said that you had to. And if <laughs> you didn't, you might lose a little rank or, or something like that. And plus, we were over there where it was us against them. Americans tended to stick together. So we we're over there and uh, we're largely living a life that um, that doesn't have the same pressures from a um, uh, from a racial standpoint. Uh, and, and that became very, very important to me later because uh, a lot of people who didn't grow up that way don't know what that gives you. But if you grow up and you don't have the racial pressures that we have in this country, and you are able to, um, uh, to to gain confidence in what you do. Um, people can't take that confidence away from you. You know, mm-hmm. so coming back here in my 20s, it was laughable when people would try to, to, to put me down from a racial standpoint because I was already affirmed. You know, I was already student body president. I was already an athlete. I was already all of those things. And I already saw, I was already a leader. Mm-hmm. And so for them to then try to tell me that I wasn't or couldn't be any of those things was laughable to me. And it just meant that I had to push through or go in a different direction. I didn't, I wouldn't accept that. And so I would say that there's a great um, disservice that's done here in this country when people grow up with that pressure and that pressure is always there. Right. And so it was a wonderful thing um, having grown up, you know, in that, that military brat environment. Uh, The other was, um, you know, I truthfully found some people that just poured into my life. 
you know, uh, in third grade, I had a teacher, Mrs. Robinson. And Mrs. Robinson, you know, you do these these tests at that age. Um, they still do them in the, back in the third or fourth grade. And then in the eighth grade, you do these national tests where they can compare everybody. And and apparently I scored um, the highest grade in the, in the class and one of the highest grades that had ever been um, scored in that school. And uh, the teacher bought me home that day. Only black teacher I ever had in elementary school. She bought me home. And she rang the doorbell and she told my parents what had happened. And she said um, that I was exceptional and that if she wanted anything done in the classroom, she went to me because she knew I would do it in a certain way. But she affirmed me. And having that affirmation, I remember the first year um, we had our summer break, um, she would, she would used to travel around Europe. And she went to Switzerland and she sent me this Hans Christian Andersen book, big old book. I have it still today. You know, um, you know, encouraging me to read over the summer and to do those things. And so I was the first person I ever had poured into my life in that way. Later in, in eighth grade, I had a, a teacher named Ms., uh, Mr. Stone, who had been a, a professor. He had a Ph.D. from UCLA. And um, he had the books just surrounded the room, wall to ceiling, all, of, all around the room. And he liked the way that I thought and wrote. And he said, I'm going to make a writer out of you. He said, first mm-hmm. of all, you're going to read every book in this room. He said, then second of all, we're going to make a writer out of you. And, you know, never had anybody to pull me aside. And it wasn't about the teaching. It wasn't about the class. It was just about something that he wanted to, to pour into me, you know. And that was also, you know, a big, uh, you know, a big thing that happened. Then when I got back to the States, you know, obviously you need a different kind of support. You need people who are really going to help you in light of where, we're, where we live with this discrimination and other things that go on. And I remember getting in not only the honor society, but in this thing called the beta club our school had. And I think I was the first black person to ever get in the beta club, which I think was about <laughs> 1% of the school. And um, something had happened that I'll never know about, but the one black teacher in the school, when they, when they called my name, he put his arm around me and he escorted me up to the stage. Mm. Right. So I know that there was some stuff going on. I don't know what the stuff was. But right. having someone who said, no, you're not going to deny my guy. Right. And as a teacher stepping out and doing that, you know, um, that had a big, um, a big, you know, influence on me, you know, which later, you know, having Dave Bing as a mentor, you know, um, really um, sort of helped galvanize and finish. But growing up, look, had five brothers and sisters, you know, a mom and a dad, mom stayed home. So we couldn't get in any trouble. Yeah, I talk to people about it all the time. It's like, you know, I might have done a whole bunch of things, but <laughs> <laughs> there was no way to do those things. So I, I didn't do them, right? right. Um, we were, um, you know, we were really, you know, respectful of our, our parents. We'd be in places a lot of times where we had to be our own best friends. So brothers and sisters hanging out, playing, teaching games, talent shows, those kinds of things, wherever we were, um, we would do that. And languages, you know, that's a, a constant. You know, we were around a lot of places where we could learn languages. So in Italy, you know, learning Italian with the kids on the street, you know, in Germany, learning German, you know, and all those things that I didn't know were going to be important because we all thought we were being kept from the United States. Sometimes as older <laughs> we were mad at my father, thinking he was keeping us over there and we wanted to go back to what they called, as brats, we called it the world. We want to go back to the world. You know, um, <laughs> Uh, then understanding after I grew up and came back and went to college that what he was giving me was invaluable and it was crazy and it helped propel a career. But, you know, so great, great childhood, you know, full of faith, full of fun, full of family, you know, and, uh, you know, and education was stressed from the very, very beginning. You know, um, my parents were in love with education. My mom was in love with words. Um, and we actually, you know, did educational things, read books. That was a big part of being part of our family, you know, and those things yeah. all held us in good stead. Yeah, I, I think that's important because on the show, uh, everybody knows on the show uh, from time to time, I talk about my grandfather who uh, he used to always say, come on, boy, I got a nugget for you, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm looking like, you know, where's a nugget at? You know, <laughs> he he always has something to tell me. You know, yeah. and on the show, uh, and and you appreciate this because it went from nuggets to dimes. You know, you know the commercial. You you're an advertisement guy. So, you know, when uh, Dame Lillard was 
uh, doing dropping dimes, dropping dimes. I mean, you, yeah. You've dropped a few dimes already and, and you've given a few nuggets that I think is important. It's important. Number one is important to me. Um, and I think it should be important to everybody when you were talking about uh, those people affirming you. Right. Uh, you know, those people giving you confidence, you know, and, and standing up for you. I think that's important. That's an important nugget. And then the other thing is the person saying, I'm you, you're going to read all these books here. Uh, for me, I think that's as we move forward in, in this generation you know, from millennials to uh, Generation Z, <laughs> uh, whatever the generations are, uh, what you said about reading is so is so valuable, right? That we and I always that's why I do the book every week. That's why I do the word every week, because I think it's important uh, that we combat illiteracy. Right. And it is a real key uh, that that person gave. So you can read all those books there. Right. And then they notice, you know what? You're going to be um, you're going to be a great writer. Right. I, I think those are two essential things that if you can if you can read, comprehend what you read, if you can write, you can do anything. There is no there is nothing that you can't do. Right. So I wanted to affirm um, that nugget or that dime right here on, on the show that you just gave about the importance of reading. And and, and because it, it, le- it you can't further your education. You can't further your education without it, you know, Um, and I think we need to do more of that. You know, it's more than just going to school. You know, we we want you to go to school and be successful. But in your spare time, right, you you graduated from college and stuff. So we graduated from college and we once we once we were at college, we realized, like, you know what, maybe not you, but me. I used to say to myself, I needed to read more, you know, <laughs> so, cause that's all we do. Right. So I want, I wanted to strengthen that point you made about reading. reading yeah. yeah we, right. you know, I mean, uh, even now, you know, um, uh, my wife, Ann and I, we're voracious readers. I mean, like uh, it, it amazes me because um, I now read on a Kindle. And so when um, 9-11 happened and I had to get back on a plane and I was just a little bit, you know, concerned my employees bought me two things. They bought me an iPod and they bought me a Kindle. <laughs> and, uh, and it's amazing because those things became my lifelines for a while, you know, putting the right music on and getting myself in the right space to get on a plane. But I started reading books at a level that I, you know, I was reading a lot, but the Kindle gave you the opportunity to just have the book there. It was at the page that you left. You could bookmark it. You could push the word and find, do the vocabulary. You could do all that with it. And so I think that um, I've had um, four generations of Kindle, but on the Kindle that I have now, you know, I've read 2,700 books on it, mm. you know, and, uh, and that's amazing. You know, you know, I'm just, I'm reading every night, you know, I read when I, when I have a minute, I put a book on that I want to read. So I have books in the queue, but, you know, but 2,700, you know, that's a lot of books, right? Okay. But um, that's how many I've read um, in this fourth edition of the Kindle. I want to ask you a question though. So what's your number one best book? Mm-hmm. That, that's good. You know, um, uh, generally speaking, I've read so many books that have had an impression on me that you would think that that's a hard um, you know, question to answer, but it's actually not. So one of the things that the military does when you're growing up when you're a military brat is they grade everything. You know, so, so Sunday school was graded. So when you went to Sunday school, you know, um, at the chapel, you know, you finish and you get your pen and you get another pen and another pen. And then you sort of age out when you like are in 11th or 12th grade. You've gone to all the Sunday school that they have. And then there's an adult thing. And so for the adult text, they only used one text that I knew of. And this is a book that's like in its 40th printing now. I think it was written, if the guy was still alive, he'd be like 120 or something like that. But <laughs> the name of the book is um, The Mighty Acts of God. And uh, the guy who wrote it is Arnold B. Rhodes. And I think he first um, wrote it in 1964, Mighty Acts of God. I've given this book to many, many people. So what he did was he wrote a Bible commentary, but it starts as saying that the story of the Bible is one story. 
it's the story of God's love for man, his redemption for man. And then he goes on to prove it by taking on the entire Bible and then relating it back to, to life as a, as, a, as a, you know, sort of a mm-hmm. commentary. And I have loved this. I mean, I loved it. As soon as I got the book, I loved it. And it was voracious. It was my companion, you know, to reading the Bible. And so as I got older and I'm like, well, I want to give this book um, to somebody else. I went and I went to the library and I got the book and I gave it, you know, and I, and I bought it and then ordered it, gave it to people. But then when Amazon came out and mm. I looked up the book, I realized that this book had been in continuous print since 1964. And they've updated it up. And I think the last update was 2000 something. But what's amazing about it is that it's as, as popular as it ever was. You have ministers and people saying how it's dog-eared, how they, they read it, what they do with it. And so I think that in my life, it's been my inf- most influential book because I'll go back and I'll say, okay, well, I'm going to read Ephesians or I'm going to read Romans or whatever. And I'll grab this book as a companion book. And he just is so matter of fact and so plain because, again, he's not trying to make it make sense like a lot of guys make it. He's trying to just tell the story. If the Bible mm. is a story and it's the story of God's love for man, then what does the scripture mean in that story? Ark. <laughs> you know, so, so the mighty acts of God, uh, Arnold B. Rhodes. Arnold B. Rhodes. Okay. The mighty acts of God. I, I hope you heard that one. I'm, I'm going to have to pick that one up myself. <laughs> Definitely, without a doubt. And, and, and so you ended up, uh, you end up graduating uh, from, from high school and, did you go directly to Syracuse? Yeah, you know it's a great and story. I just want to know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was a, it was a, you know, <laughs> it was this convenience. So, so you know, we were in in Italy, and I was trying to figure out Syracuse, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, that, you know, I mean, like, um, I didn't know where Syracuse was, what Syracuse was. I had applied to Brown and Ivy League school. I applied to Carnegie Mellon, um, Yale, and one other school. Um, uh, let's see. Yeah. Yeah. One other school. I can't remember right now, but anyway, re- re- applied to those schools because I want to do a lot of different things. And so I'm like, well, if I get into Brown, I'll major in government. If I get into this one, I'll major, you know, so the schools represented different pathways. Right. So I got into all the schools and then I was really confused. Right. So, <laughs> so my dad said, listen, we're leaving Italy. We're going to be in, um, Rome, New York. And uh, he was going to be at Rome, New York, working Rome Air Developmental Center at the Griffiths Air Force Base. And he said, there's a good college near there, Syracuse. He said, you go to Syracuse, you know, you do keep your grades up and you can transfer anywhere in the way you want to go when you figure out what you want to do. <laughs> so I wasn't sold. I was like, nah, I may get stuck in Syracuse. So <laughs> I, I didn't apply right away. I waited. So after the deadline was over and I had applied everywhere else, um, I applied to Syracuse late. So they called us up on the phone, right? They said, hey, you know, a pretty good application, you're in. And so, you know, so they just, I never even got a letter. They just called me and said, you're in, right? <laughs> so um, went to Syracuse and, um, you know, look, in those days, you remember it snowed 260 uh, inches a year. It was like Syracuse wasn't the place anybody wanted to be. So I got to Syracuse. And some first semester, I'm, I'm, I'm in the library, um, I'm studying, I look out the window, and this 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 girl is walk, woman is walking down the street, right? Sidewalk. Mm-hmm. I looked at her, man. I looked, the other guys were looking too. Right? So <laughs> one of the prettiest girls I've ever seen in my life. And uh, we've been married 35 years in October, right? And uh, <laughs> That there you go. That's what kept me in uh, in, in Syracuse. Yeah, only a woman to keep you in the cold. <laughs> <laughs> That's still really Bob. I was there for the duration after that. Point. Oh man, I should have known. <laughs> yeah, and so um, you know, so I stayed, and you know, and and look, and there were great things about Syracuse. You know, three really. The first thing is that. I wanted to do something that was a little bit different than what they had done. I wanted to major in modern foreign languages, and I wanted to do a dual degree program also in political science. So I thought I wanted to be an international lawyer. And they didn't really have anybody at Syracuse for that major. But there was a lady, Professor Adorno, and her husband was a visiting professor uh, from Harvard at Cornell. 
So Syracuse had given her a job because she wanted to travel with her husband. And uh, so um, she said that she would take me on as my advisor. And this woman was all that in a bag of chips. And she became my, um, my, you know, my advisor. She put together the, the degree program, which they signed off on. And so I was able to get my modern foreign um, languages and political science degrees um, at, at Syracuse. And so I got a good education. Um, uh, after that, um, uh, the second wonderful thing happened. And there was a guy by the name of Robert Hill that was at Syracuse. And he was, first of all, the, the spokesperson for the university, became the vice dean or something like that, um, assistant dean. But whatever, he got the idea that he would do uh, one reunion for minority students called Coming Back Together. So he said, every year you know, that you graduated, you come back in the same year and I'll have one big minority reunion. So first, um, you know, a private university in the country to do that, he did the first one and, you know, we're talking about Dave Bing, Jim Brown, Suzanne DePass, you know, just everybody in, in one place. And um, really anxious to connect to the young people who were at school. And that was genius, you know, because um, that connection that I got with that group of people and they really worked hard to help me even after school was extremely important. Um, you know, so, so that was thing number two, uh, three uh, rather. And, you know, so, and, and then the, the final thing about Syracuse is that I went into the right field. So the Newhouse School is considered to be one of the top advertising programs in the country, if not the top. Newhouse considered to be the top um, broadcast, uh, you know, media school in the country, mm -hmm. if not, you know. And so uh, when I decided to change my major, you know, and to, you know, and, and to really focus um, uh, on, uh, on that, when I got out, we had the, the mafia, you know, we had the Maxwell Mafia with political science with uh, Donna Shalali and Biden and all those guys having gone to Syracuse. And then we have this crazy media mafia where, you know, the, the publisher of, uh, of everything, the Sports Illustrated and the New Yorker and the New York Times and, you know, half of the staff at ESPN, all those are Syracuse people, you know. And so now you've got this wonderful connection through that. And so, look, it, it could not have been better for me in my career had I gone to Harvard, you know, just right. for, in terms of being able to connect to people who could really just get you up and out and started in your career. Yeah. And you you just named some high power, high power people. And, uh, you know, I was, we were talking about uh, when we were at the Syracuse game and they, they, they were showing the the lacrosse team. I mean, they had won the championship or something like that and and i would you know i always go like who's the greatest lacrosse player of all time you know and everybody yeah we know we know jim brown yeah <laughs> I, mean, I mean it's amazing because we only see jim brown uh you know as the football player or even the actor but right. you know he, he was he he was there to play lacrosse so absolutely I mean, <laughs> and he's still on those lists as uh, you know i was just reading because we've had so many great lacrosse players since then everywhere and Jim Brown's still number one on that list. Yeah, still uh, number one on the list. Yeah. yeah, and then uh, I was showing the picture of you and Dave Bing. One of my, you know, I had to put Dave Bing up there because uh, Dave was one of my favorite players growing up, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, with the Detroit Pistons. And just amazing. And the other part of I, what I, uh, you know, why I like Dave Bing and you can probably talk a little bit more about that, is that Dave was not only a basketball player, but after his career was over, he transitioned well. And many many of our entertainers and athletes don't know how to transition from what they're doing into real life. And and Dave did uh, start in the, um, was the Bing Corporation. Bing Steel, yeah. Steel it's Corporation. And, manufacturing, absolutely. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so I was proud of him. And one time, I think he was like running for mayor or something like in there. He was the mayor, the mayor of Detroit. I mayor mean, Detroit. yeah, so, I so mean, Dave is, Dave is an amazing guy because you know, um, there are a lot of great ball players, and there are a lot of people who paid you if, if they paid you attention, you would, you know, you would, you would, you would return the, the favor. But Dave and everybody who knows him and knows him well says exactly the same thing. If you look up integrity in the encyclopedia, it would say Dave Bing, you know, because Dave Bing just, I mean, he's just a man of great integrity. 
And so when he was, um, I was in the class of people he was helping um, um, Coleman, you know, Derek Coleman was another guy who at the same time that we were spending a lot of time together, he was spending a lot of time with Derek. And I mean, he was always on. I remember one time we had to go to this dinner, big dinner. It maybe had something to do with the all-star game, the NBA all-star game. And he had invited us and Derek comes out in his sweatpants and stuff. And, uh, um, you know, Dave sent him back to the hotel room to change. He's like, no, that's not the way that we're going to represent ourselves here. You know, and, and, and he was that guy all the time. I mean, like he'd give you a call out of the blue and the call would just be about life. And it would be about trying to, to help you understand. Like I was uh, married and commuting to New York City to work. And he called me up out of the blue and he's like, um, Larry, he says, where are you? I said, uh, I'm, I'm in Manhattan. And he said, where's Ann? I said, Ann's in Syracuse. And he said, well, listen. And then he just dressed me up and down, you know, about how mm -hmm. we should be in the same place and about why that was important and how um, I should, even at the beginning of my career, understand what was important. And he's like, I made mistakes, he says, and, and, and now I can help you not make the same mistakes. Mm -hmm. And so he was that kind of guy to us, you know, and at the same time, he was exposing us. He took us to um, to the, the the first uh, NBA All-Star game where they did the top 50 players of all time. He was one of mm -hmm. them still playing in the alumni game at that time and still. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, the one of the pictures that you guys showed was just a couple of years ago at the NBA uh, All-Star game in New Orleans where, um, you know, he was um, he and two other guys started the Retired Players Association. And so we were just up there in the suite for the Retired Players Association. And Dave walked in and man, and we hugged for like three whole minutes, right? <laughs> and we were just talking. I hadn't seen him in a little while. And, um, you know, we were just, 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 you know, cutting it up. Uh, but um, when his company was in its heyday, um, he was the largest African American owned company in the country. I think he had more than 3,000 employees. Um, and he was, um, you know, both doing strip steel and then his company, Superb Manufacturing, was making the, the doors, the inside doors for Chrysler's and for Ford's and for GM's. You know, he was in business with the Canadian government. You know, so I had never seen anybody who was throwing it down like that. I think that year the president named him the business, small business person of the year. I mean, he was really just it everywhere and he never stopped. I got involved in board work because of Dave. You know, when they found out Dave and I were friends, they used to call me up when they wanted Dave to do something. So they called me <laughs> up at Syracuse and they said, hey, listen, you know, we're about to do this for the Domo. You know, we're going to do this and we need Dave to, to give some money and stuff. And silly me, I called Dave and said, hey, Dave, because I was excited they were calling me. So I called right. up Dave and tell him. And so once Dave said, he said, listen, he says, it's OK to be helpful. He says, and, and it's OK to, to understand, you know, where you stand. But he said. Before you call me again, you figure out what's in it for you. You figure out what's in it for me. You know, it's just giving me a way of thinking, right? Right, right, and right. So, um, and I didn't even know how to think that way. So he really was instrumental in getting me, you know, put on a Syracuse board. You know, and then once there, I mean, you know, I was 20, in my 20s, man. I stayed on a board at Syracuse for 19 years. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Dave was really just important and doing those kinds of things. And, um, and look, I can never say enough good things about that guy. You know what I mean? And I'm always saying that. And look, I had a father, you know, my father was a strong influence in my life. My father's my idol, you know, but my father as a serviceman couldn't do for me in business what Dave did for me. Yeah. You know, exposure, introducing to me people. I mean, Dave co-signed for the first loan I needed to start a company. Wow. No, yeah. That's what you call the hero. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and so you mentioned, you know, being on the Syracuse board, uh, board of directors for the Syracuse University uh, for 19 years. And then, man, the whole world of boards opened up uh, yeah. in yeah. regards to uh, what you were, you know, basically doing. So talk a little bit about those boards that you now uh we're on or currently sitting on. Yeah, and, and that's good. So so being, you know, working with, um, you know, the Syracuse board, um, our designation was um, the School of Social Work, which then became 
the School of Human Dynamics, which um, turned and the School of Human Dynamics houses the um, the board of um, it houses the, the Falk School of Sport Management. So so me and, uh, and Brandon Steiner and David Falk, the sports agent, were on advisory board for um, the School of Sport Management. Um, uh, you know, Falk eventually gave a naming, you know, a donation, and that's why it's called the Falk School. But um, those were really heady times. And uh, and uh, and I first went on the board not knowing what my role was going to be as a young guy. I didn't have money to give to the university. I'm like, well, what, why am I there? And then uh, ultimately started to really find my space, you know, and figured out that one of the things that, that, that I saw that the university needed was it needed to equip people in different ways than we would be equipping them. So when a kid came in and he was majoring in one thing, uh, couldn't we get him a cross-platform degree where he would also be able to do something else with it? So couldn't he be sports and business, or could he be, you know, just to have, you know, mix and match so that you get a, a marketable, you know, degree? And um, so with um, with sport management, we finally were able to put some of those things to the test and found out that they work um, work beautifully. So um, you know, I'm there, and the board was a you know it was a pretty good board with lots of good names on it. And uh, so uh, I just started my company and Derek Wittenberg came out and he said, look, you know, the V Foundation could really use you. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, I mean, I'm like everybody else. I look and I see Coach K and Robin Roberts and Dick Vitale and all those guys on the board. And I'm like, well, I'll go to the meeting. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but they ain't going to pick me. You know what I mean? You know, I just didn't really see that happening. And so, uh, so Derek came in, they, um, they sent a group um, uh, to fly into New York to talk to me. Um, we talked, and um, and as a result of that, they, they did offer the, the, the board position. And um, little did I know how much cancer was gonna affect me with my sister and other people, but going on that board has been um, been really amazing to me. And even, you know, at the time I had been playing golf with, uh, with um, Stuart Scott, you know, I put Stuart on, uh, you no, know, a television commercial, you know, and so it turned out being um, being really awesome that uh, that I was on, you know, got on the board of the, of the V Foundation. So I'm doing that. A month later, I get a call from um, uh, one of my former General Motors uh, clients. He was the CMO, Brent Dewar, and he was now the president of NASCAR. And he said, "Listen, Larry," he said, like. NASCAR needs some board members like you, man. He says they need some people who've been around who can help diversify the company, the board, the sport. Uh, and I'd like for you to, um, you know, I'd like for you to, to, to come and interview. Uh, and he said, better still, they'll come to New York and interview with you. And I looked at the thing and it was like crazy. It's like all the outside directors were billionaires. It was Edsel Ford the third, you know, um, Hyatt Brown. I'm like, now I know this guy is crazy because I, you know, I mean, like, I ain't getting on this board. So I think at the time, the short list was me, the president of Chrysler at the time, some other people like that. So I went down to the Daytona 500 and um, they had the CEO breakfast. And I thought it meant the CEO of NASCAR has a breakfast for the people. But I walk in there and it's CEOs from all over America. You know, it's the Mars family, you know, um, Forrest Mars. It's all these guys from all these companies. And I'm like, wow, this is this is really amazing. Then lo and behold, I come back from the Daytona 500. They give me a call and they say, yeah, we'd like to extend an offer uh, to put you on the board. I'm like, uh, OK, you know, <laughs> right now is, you know, it's a compensated board. It's a corporate board. It's publicly traded with uh, International Speedway Corporation was the NASCAR side that was publicly traded on, uh, on NASDAQ. And so now all of a sudden I'm a board director on a, on a corporate board. You know what I mean? And so. So um, I did that. Uh, I got invited under the Black Board Directors Group, you know, and so so I'm doing that. And that allowed me to meet Congressman Lewis and all these other people, Vernon Jordan. Um, so now I'm just in this, I, you know, I'm in this place where God has just opened up all of these doors where I'm sitting there. And it's about 13 years ago saying, OK, it's on now. I mean, this is, this is, this is crazy because I remember telling the Mars family, you know, I remember telling them, um, listen, be very careful, you know, because I only have one speed. If you put me on the board, I'm going to try to make that better. I'm going to try to make changes. It's not going to be business as usual. I won't be a rubber stamp. I don't know how to be a rubber stamp. And, um, you know, something in that um, they understood and, and liked. 
And so, you know, when I came on, then we've been able to to move and uh, both with the V Foundation and with, um, you know, with NASCAR. Um, if you've been looking, you know, wholesale changes. I mean, Michael Jordan's in the sport, Pitbull's in the sport, Emmett Smith's in the sport. Um, you know, uh, we've got black drivers at every level. You've got, you know, Bubba, everybody knows, Jesse Awuji's in Xfinity. Um, it's been just outstanding and amazing. And when you go to the races now, all those people who like fast cars, who were at their houses because they didn't feel invited to the track, now all of a sudden feel like they could come. You know, and so a real, um, a real moment for me this year that really was emotional. I went to Talladega twice this year. So they had two races. The first Talladega race that I went to, um, I'm walking uh, along the pit crew area and, you know, and you see all the pit crew guys from D1 and D2 and HBCUs now that are on the pit crews, you know, you just see a lot of people. And so these three or four, um, you know, black guys were walking towards me and they're not walking around me. And when they get up to me, they say, are you Larry Woodard? And I said, yes. And uh, they were from Alabama Power. And one of the guys I think was the fire chief. And he said to me, they said to me, um, we want to thank you. And the guy asked if he could hug me. And so he hugged me and we took a picture together. And he said to me, when we were kids, we were told to stay off of Route 20, which is the, the highway that you know, the Talladega is on, us off of. He said, because they said that the Talladega race was akin to a Klan rally. So when all those people would come, they would stay away from that whole area. They just didn't feel welcome and they felt like, you know, it was ominous that something might happen. And here they are years later and, and you know, and they're able to walk on the track, walk around the place with VIP badges on, be in a place where all this stuff is going on. And so that stuff makes me extraordinarily proud, you know, mm -hmm. that, uh, that, that, that has happened to that sport. And that sport is truly open for business. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, truly. And I, I think I was, I was, I was looking up something in uh, historically black college. Uh, the Winston Salem has a uh, degree program in, uh, in in regards to NASA. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Na to NASCAR. Yeah, yeah. They do. you know they do, and uh, and you see a lot of HBCUs working. You see a lot of give backs. Um, you know, um, uh, right in Daytona is uh, Bethune Cookman now University and um, you know NASCAR we give a, a big donation to them every year you know they're right on France um, you know a loop Boulevard right a Speedway mm -hmm. Boulevard they're right there <laughs> um, and um, you know and, and it's just been um, look whenever you know like in the things that we've done in advertising when I uh, open up uh, advertising age or ad week and I see somebody that I hired um, and promoted and trained and they're now the president of an ad agency or, you know, or they have a really big job in advertising. Um, it makes me very, very excited. I, I remember uh, a cathartic moment for me was when I was chairman of the American Association of Advertising Agencies, New York chapter, which, you know, all, most of the agencies are in New York. So, you know, I had the big kahunas who were all in, on, on my board. And end of the year came, we normally had a surplus. I think that year our surplus was a couple of million dollars. Um, and they said, well, you know, you sign off as the chairman on how we use the money. I said, well, how do you traditionally use it? They said, well, we, we give some here and here, and then we give out bonuses to the staff. You know, that's what we do with the money. And I said, well, how many um, minority scholarships, diversity scholarships do we get? And they said, well, one. So we've got this program where we put people in two, you know, um, these things make, but we only give away one scholarship. And I said, well, how much scholar with, 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 with this, amount, this amount of money? How much? How many scholarships would that that do? And I think they said something like 50, 45, whatever. And I said, well, that's how many scholarships we give now, right? And now it's all those years later, 13, 14 years, and that's how many scholarships are being given, you know, on an annual basis. And all those things are really a badge of honor, you know, where when you get there, you know, um, a real uh, moment in my life was, a few years ago when John Lewis, when Congressman Lewis was still alive and he came to Black Board Directors in Laguna Beach in California and he addressed us. And he said that you guys are captains of industry. You guys are, you know, you're, you're elite in terms of where you've gotten to in, in corporate America. He said, I would only ask one thing of you. And then he paused and he said that you would open your mouths and that you would move your feet. 
Mm-hmm. And I never forgot that ever, because a lot of times that's all that it requires for us when we're in these places uh, to not be silent, you know, to open up our mouths and to say something that really de- is the only person in the room that's going to open up and defend, you know, what we know is true is us, unless we're mm-hmm. not brave enough to do it, right? Yeah. And, and so that um, that's something that I've always tried to do. Yeah, awesome. Um, I want to go back for a moment to to your. Uh, I want you to talk a little bit about your wife. I want to go back to that for a moment before we move forward, because <laughs> it, it was a moment there when you said, "Well, I met this young lady." <laughs> she walked by the. Yeah. So go back and talk about your wife for a little bit for a little while here. Yeah, the the getting together was hilarious because we actually didn't necessarily go out in college. It was after college, but during mm-hmm. college, we always liked each other. We were just on different paths. So um, she did her um, junior year abroad in, in London and I did mine in Italy. And so um, when I went to the meeting, the guy who was in charge of uh, the program said, hey, listen, we happen to have one guy here who's lived in all these countries. And so he could like answer questions for people if they have them afterwards. So afterwards, she came up and she was asking questions and I was answering them, you know, and she (laughs) gave me her number and I took it. Right. (laughs) And um, I didn't call her before I went to Europe. And when I came back, the number didn't work anymore. Right. At the same time, she tells stories like, so I was on a bus going downtown and I looked out the window and there you were. And I said, there's that nice young man. Right. You know, (laughs) keep on doing that, you know, so. Um, so uh, I graduated, I was going to a local church and I had some buddies who were trying to fix me up. You know, they would take me to all the sorority parties, all the fraternity, you know, they, they were just trying to get me engaged. Right. Right. So, um, I didn't want to go. And so Shari Brown stuck some tickets in my pocket. She said, look, you got to go tonight. You know, there's a woman I want you to meet, you know, you got to go to this thing. And so I said, okay. So um, went to, they were called Delta sets. The Deltas put it on, right? So I <laughs> yeah. went there and I walk in and they're in the back waving me on. So I'm trying to walk towards them when all of a sudden I see Ann. And I'm like, nah, I ain't letting it get out of my clutch. No, no way, no shit. <laughs> right. Ain't going to happen this time. So I walked up to her and immediately asked her out for a date. And she said, yes. You know, and um, after that, we started dating it was hilarious because she wanted to finish her get tenure, three years working in Syracuse, get tenure and move back down to Manhattan. That was her goal. That was her focus. That's what she was going to do no matter what. And so we're dating. But every once in a while, she just had to pause like for a commercial and say, don't get too excited because I'm going back to Syracuse, to New York City. Right? That's where I'm going. Right. right. <laughs> so, so she wouldn't let herself fall. You know, so we're getting closer and closer and closer. But she's just reminding me on that date, I'm packing up my apartment and I'm gone. And so that date came and she packed up her apartment and I was sick. You know, I'm like, I'm the team. <laughs> she packed up her apartment. I'm at work. You know, she puts all the stuff wherever she puts it. And then she takes her plants and she's going to go give her plants to her friend. She backs up and she wrecks her car. She hits a tree mm-hmm. and the car is messed up. And of course, I get a big smile on my face. I said, I got a car guy. I got to fix your car. You know, just like, let me take you over here. And let's do this and everything. And, and you, you know, you got to stay in Syracuse because like, you know, and everything. So uh, that week, at some point, she finally just gave in and fell in love. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that was it. You know, a few years later, we were married. And the rest is history. And, and it's been great because, you know, to have, um, you know, God had been working in her life the whole time she was, you know, in school, particularly towards the end. Now, I was playing in church one, um, you know, one Sunday when she walked down the aisle and gave her life to Christ. And, um, you know, which was great. <laughs> like God giving you the desires of your heart, you know. Right. And uh, after that point, you know, um, you know, we've been inseparable for, you know, for, you know, for look over 35 years. Um, so that's been, been, been amazing. I saw you had a guitar picture, right? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Cause you, sometimes you'd be on Facebook, you'd be playing your guitar and yeah. singing and stuff like that. Yeah. I try not to, um, I try not to mix and match for people. So a lot of times when people hear me play, 
it's the first time they're, 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 they're hearing it, right? And so I remember that was the first time my employees heard me play. I played at the Christmas party and they <laughs> lost their minds. You know, I had done a work about, um, I called it the Vigilante Blues. And I was <laughs> like a song, you know, I had a lot of stuff in it. Um, but, you know, look, um, when you live life, one of the things that I know, particularly as a boss and, and having a company, is that, you know, you can create a good environment. I had a lot of bad bosses when I was growing up, you know, but um, but I have a, a you know I've always tried to have a, an atmosphere and an environment you know at work where people can really really uh, enjoy themselves and, and and feel that it's special. Yeah, and uh, I want to go back into um, to the advertisement, uh, marketing advertisement. I want to show this uh, one of your one of your pieces. And uh, then we'll talk a little bit about advertising. Great. So I'm here in Las Vegas, and it's all about the beef throw right now. We are here to actually pay tribute to our man, Stuart Scott. And how we do that is we donate to the Beef Foundation uh, for cancer research. So he did a lot for our community, uh, definitely did a lot for the game. So big shout out to Stuart Scott. And uh, we get to call out five people, so I'm gonna let you go first, Larry. All right, so I'm calling out Mark King and also uh, Kevin Plank, both of whom are fellow board members. Also, Steve Phelps from NASCAR. Uh, you're going big time on the top shelf. Yeah, yeah. Okay, all right, I got something for that. I'm going to go with Brandon Steiner. Brandon? New York, so I was just with you, B, so get, get it ready. And also, I'm going to go with uh, the deputy commissioner of the NBA, Mr. Mark Tatum. I need you for this beat throw right now. So get your get your game face on. I need to see some headband rocking and some high socks. V.org. V.org. Donate. Shout out to Iceman George Gerber. Where's Ice? Where's Ice? <laughs> Oh <laughs> yeah! Oh man, yeah that, that 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 was one of the clips, and I I enjoyed um you know being you you being on the uh, V board foundation board and and over the last couple of years for Stuart Scott yeah right um you know there there's a big push towards uh, Stuart Scott and uh, and the foundation you know in in and doing things in his name as well. And uh, so, yeah, that, and, you know, with coach, there, there's some pictures there. We got, uh, you know, there were coach over there. We got Nate Tiny Archibald, a number of other people as well. Um, and then Herman Bulls, which I interviewed uh, on the podcast uh, a few weeks ago. Um, and then of course my man, Wes Matthews, and you do it, let me just say, you did our golf outing for us at the Boys and Girls Club of Mount Vernon. You did a tremendous job, doing a tremendous job for the V Foundation in this area, um, you know, in terms of support of research of cancer. Uh, and we all know Coach Falvano. Uh, he's the guy who recruited me in high school. And just an amazing, wonderful energy, just an amazing person. So. I uh, mean, uh, kudos, man, for what you uh, are doing, Robin Robbins. Uh, you know, for the for the V Foundation, man. And c congratulations, man, on that. Yeah. And um, you know, real quick, we want to show this other commercial. You say is one of your favorites. I I watched it a couple of times. I I thought it was it was a it was a great piece. So let, let's check this out real quick. Is this the only barber shop in town? Yeah, but they're great. Howdy. May I use your phone, please? Now all calling card calls cost as little as calls from home. Yo, Claude, it's Ricky. Hey, hey, Ricky calling from college. How's it going, dog? Hey, y'all, Ricky's in the house. What's going on, baby? I got a little situation here, and I was wondering if you could hook me up. All calls from home, calls made to your Sprint 800 number, and even calling card calls are always just a dime a minute. OK, now listen. Ricky likes his sides faded short. Yeah. You take the top down with the clippers, yeah. then use the scissors. Yeah. 
Keep it real, baby. Call now for a dime every time, even on calling cards. I thought those Philly fades were played out. Stay in touch when you really need to. Isn't that the point of contact? Call 1-888-IN-TOUCH or visit. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's good. He had to make his phone call home, man. Say, <laughs> yeah, that's one of the things that I think that um, that we started to do that people didn't understand. You know, you had uh, some African-American ad agencies and they would be doing stuff that was particularly for African-Americans. And then we came along and we said, no, there's a such thing as urban culture. And we could take this urban culture thing and we could talk to everybody. So we'd be doing these spots and our spots would wind up running everywhere on CNN, everywhere, right? And they mm -hmm. largely ran everywhere because we were talking about things everybody understood, everybody could get behind. We used a lot of humor, you know, and um, and that really started to change the way that advertising and commercials were done. Period. Yeah, and then you know you had two other spots. I didn't I didn't put them on, but you had Jay Z, yeah, uh, and you had my man Ludacris, yeah, uh, you know, uh, great commercials. <laughs> but you know, talk about the industry and you know. Uh, you know, how is it going now? What, you know, what are some of the changes, uh, you know, if, if particularly if people want to get in, get into that industry now? Yeah. 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 I, I think it's, it's wide open. I think that one of the things that happened when I got in the industry and I saw the, the industry was so closed, it was a surprise to me. And I wanted to, to change it um, both by being a change agent by going, doing well and being able to offer jobs and employment and, you know, the recruiting and those kinds of things, but also to be able to open up the eyes to people who were in advertising who might be, you know, not a diverse person, you know, white person or whatever, you know, in a, in a role where they just didn't understand how to put our creativity to use. Right. And so um, I used to say a lot early on that uh, we always had creative people. I would always say I would have hired most deaf as a creative, um, yeah, as a copywriter. <laughs> you know, you just had all these people who were out there doing crazy things. And now a lot of people know it. And a lot of celebrities start their own ad agencies because of it. But in the beginning, that wasn't true. And I think that we did a, a good job of helping to make that a possibility. I mean, uh, first year I got to Vigilante, we were agency of the year. Uh, for is in the next year we were agency of the year. Next year we were agency of the year. Next year we were runner up for agency of the year. So we're winning all the big awards. We're doing all that stuff. And that gives us a pulpit to be able to talk about a lot of things, which we started doing. And so that's one part of it that's huge. Uh, the other part of it is that, you know, um, this uh, millennials and Gen Z, they're a little bit different than we are. And uh, they have in a lot of ways, um, they're, they're, they're fearless. They have gone out there and sort of taken the mantle and done some things uh, that perhaps, you know, we didn't think that would, were able to be done or people didn't think were able to be done. And uh, they, they've done it. And that's been wonderful for business. Yeah. And then uh, how, how do you, you know, now with with social media, um, it, it's like a, a whole new world, you know, out there now. Well, it is. And uh, they, you know, I mean, these kids, man, but before they get out of school, they're influencers. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you can't stop them because they're unstoppable. Yeah. And, and one of the things I always liked about advertisement and marketing, it was similar to, you know, when I, when I was a young kid, I loved art. Right. And I love the creativity about art. That's what I love about marketing and and uh advertisement because yeah I, you have to be creative yeah i've seen some weird stuff man i mean yeah. my, my wife and i tell you uh you know we were in north carolina and we were looking at television and 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 we're looking at we seen this the guy the, the commercial was about selling it was selling the couch right mm -hmm. right uh, and they had a cow behind it right i'm like uh i'm, I'm looking at the commercial i'm looking at She's like, what, what, what just happened? I mean, you know, you, <laughs> why you get, you know, I understood it, you know, leather, the cow, I mean, but I don't think animal rights people would, you know, appreciate the commercial, but I mean, uh, I was like, man, I've seen a, a lot of weird commercials. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, so yeah, I mean, it, one of the things that's happened is that, um, now there are more millennials now, Gen Z's getting into the, the environment. And um, 
they've had a lot more input. Like, you know, when you started in my business, they would say, look, read books, read magazines, go to movies, do all that kind of stuff, because you need a lot of reference, you know, to be able to put something out there that everybody understands. But now with the Internet, man, you know, kids are able to go anywhere in the world. They're able to go all over the place, see all these things. Um, my nephews, I asked them what they wanted for Christmas one year, and they told me they wanted this crazy like anime stuff. And I went out and got it for them. And then when I they were looking at it, I noticed that they already knew it a lot. And so I was saying to them, um, if you already saw it, why did you want it? And they were like, because we were watching it on our little phones. And we couldn't really read the subtitles, right? So they wanted to see it bigger so that they could, you know, they, they could read and see what was going on. But they still liked it, and they were still doing it. And I find that, you know, that, that that's what's happening. And so, as you have all of these young people, and they just have all of these influences from all over the place, you got to get up early in the morning to to reach them in a creative way, you know, and to actually um, interrupt their thinking pattern, you know, and to hit them with something that causes them to pay attention. Right. Uh, well, have you come up with it? Yeah, <laughs> you know, you know, we do some we do some strange stuff. I mean, like uh, one of the great things about uh, about being in this industry is it just keeps you young. I mean, um, last year I talked to NASCAR about being on what's called the Discord server, uh, D I S C O R D, and NASCAR never heard of it. And I'm like, no, I think that businesses should be on the Discord server because essentially Discord is a gaming server. It's how kids play these games and they all, um, you know, they'd be in different places, but they're all in teams playing against each other. Right. Um, so Discord server has 78 million people on it. So I said, if there's 78 million people on something, then we, we need to go there and establish a, you know, a, a presence. So NASCAR got on the Discord server and they were the first American company to do so. They were the first company to do it. And now it's huge. It's a huge community. Right. And um, so those kinds of things where you're paying attention to young people and, you know, phase clan, the gamers, the gamers, a hundred thieves. We're always I always have young people coming in, hipping me to something that I never knew anything about, you know, and then we jump <laughs> into it and we listen to them and we, we, we explore it a little bit. And then we try to see if it's relevant to be to put on a broader stage. But we learn every day and every day someone comes to me and they're telling me about something that is just amazing that they've seen, you know, happen in Africa or happening in Italy, like this, um, this, uh, this young black kid who is the number one guy on, uh, on TikTok and he's black, but he's Italian. He doesn't, <laughs> doesn't, he doesn't use any words. He just uses gestures and his stuff is hilarious. And um, he's come out of nowhere. Now he's got a Coca-Cola contract. He's got all these contracts with all these big people um, just from, you know, being in his room, you know, and deciding that he wants to like comment on stuff without using words. And he's got a real expressive face. Right. <laughs> um, so it's not going to be done the same way. But we, we saw it coming. I, we talked to clients. I remember, you know, 15 years ago and we told them that as the Internet grows and as those things grow, people are going to want to broadcast out. It's not going to be about you talking to them. It's going to be about them talking to you. And people are going to have influence because everybody's going to be a broadcaster. And right. that's the way, you know, you could see me inside the minds on YouTube saying that 15 years ago, saying that. But that's what's come to fruition. Now it's a two way street. It's about um, how I want to take my entertainment. And if not, I may create my entertainment. Mm, awesome. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. That's, that's good insight right there. And uh, hey, I don't know if you guys remember earlier in the show, I had my book of the week. Right. And it was point me in the right direction. Right. Uh, it's a devotional for busy, busy people. Uh, hey, Larry, D Larry D. Wood is right in front of you. Right. He's he's the author of the book. Right. And uh, right on the screen right there, you can uh, his information is there. I mean, you should get the book. Right. And uh, especially if you're busy. <laughs> right. If you're busy, you need to get that book. Right. Because you need to keep your you know, keep your mind settled, you know, and uh, Larry's done a great job with the book. Is, is there another one coming? Oh, there most certainly is. You know, I must tell you that, the, the, you know, the sort of the initial starting point for um, point me in the right direction. was I was writing all those devotions to encourage myself. So the very first one was actually my dad gave me a call and said that he had just been diagnosed with lung cancer. 
And so when he did, I wanted to write something back to him that would encourage him. And so I started with the sentence, what to do when you get bad news. Mm. And that's how they started. Yeah, I remember that one. Yeah. And uh, so after I wrote that one, um, I was putting them online and I didn't know people were sharing them with each other. So after I had a few thousand people telling me they, they were reading them every day, I said, oh, this is a book. And so then, you know, went out, you know, um, got the book published. And uh, now the book that I'm writing now is called Kickstart. Um, and it's about um, every once in a while I run into people and they tell me, well, they they want to do daily devotions, but they can't get in the habit. They can't get in the habit of spending some time with God every day. They don't know how to do it. Their lives are too mm -hmm. chaotic. Stuff happens. They forget. You know, they don't have, you know, they don't know how to get started. And so Kickstart is all about how to start. Mm. Oh, and, I like that. So how, do you, how do you start that? So, so that's yeah. the book I'm writing now. So we're coming to a close right now. Uh, you, we're going to run a little bit over, but it's okay. Oh, yeah, you, you saw the many faces of Larry, but uh, I had to put these on there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's the animation, Larry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then the Rices, you know, you, you know, you were a longtime mentor and stuff like that for some of the, for uh, Jordan, yeah. right? And Very Jared. Yeah, and then you see one one of the powerful pictures is the mother's a judge, and and then you know all the son the father's a lawyer, and all the sons become lawyer. Now J Jordan's a a pastor, um, and then I think that the um, Jared is now a judge, right? That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah Jared's a judge. So the Rice family, you know, uh, they it did a lot of attorney work for me back in the day. <laughs> and then you got John Stocks and then they go Herman Herman Bulls um at the V Foundation. He was the honoree. Yeah. Uh we had an amazing time. Cassie Russell, we mentioned Stuart Scott. Yeah. Right? Yes. Larry, Larry run into some folks. Samuel <laughs> Jackson, Robin Roberts, Dougie Fresh, my brother's in the house. You know, and then yeah, dealing with baseball tonight, um, and NFL Live. Larry, you've done it all, man. You know, Bless. hey, Bless. Look, Harry Ball Belafonte. Oh, no. What would we give? Uh, you know, Steve Jobs. We'll never forget Steve Jobs because, you know, every time we pick up our phone, right? Mm -hmm. Awesome. You know, hey, what what an amazing mind. Bob Johnson, who I met a few times. Jesse Jackson's, who I met. Um, yeah, you you. Yeah, around the day they go to junkyard dog. You know, Jerome Williams, man, what a beautiful spirit. You know, Kenny Smith, Walt Frazier, Sweet Cash, John Legend. I think that's Yolanda Adams right there and Fred Hammonds. Girl, yeah. Ooh, we heard Yolanda oh saying boy. Oh, Tiger. Yeah, he did a lot of work with the uh with the Tiger Woods Foundation. You know, and there go MJ, who's now not, not only ball and ownership, but NASCAR, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, you know, I'm that story with, with Michael Jordan seeing the guy on a motorcycle, man, you know. And next thing you know, you got a motorcycle and got the guy and, you know, now the guy's racing on, you know, <laughs> just, just awesome stuff, man. So, Larry, I want to say uh, thank you, man man uh thank you for your friendship number one uh thank you for your support over the years um it's my pleasure to come and hang out with you at the golf outings and uh want well, to thank you for tonight man it was a, any any it is just a blessing man to and, and it shows that man if you make up your mind man and there's something in your heart you want to do and you're willing to put in the work man you can get it done Right. And uh, you 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 you're doing some amazing things and you're walking into some areas that a lot of us hadn't had the opportunity to walk into. So any any final thoughts or comments? Uh, before yeah, we go? Just, just one. Uh, and, and it, you know, Lowe's, uh, I've watched, you, you know, these years that we've been friends and, um, you know, and, and, and every year uh, I think I gain an, an admiration and respect for what you've been able to do in the community and in the, in the lives that you touch. And, uh, and you just remind me of, of an uncle of mine, you know, um, we used to call him Uncle Heavy. <laughs> so, um, you know, he passed away and I was going down to his funeral 
and they were telling me that it was going to be in, in a regional school. And I was upset. I was like, y'all needed money for a church. Why didn't you call me? I mean, I was like all the wrong way <laughs> down there. And there are hundreds and hundreds of seats set up because that's the space they needed for somebody who had spent his whole life in one community. And mm. he touched that community in so many ways. And people told all kinds of crazy stories about what he had done to help them that pulling out of the woodwork and everything. And that's when I began to really understand the power of a life. You know, and it's not just about going out and, uh, and meeting everybody and doing everything. You know, sometimes it's about staying where you are and just being quality right there. You know, and so just want to thank you, you know, A, for your friendship and B, for the fact that you're clearly that person here and in Mount Vernon. Uh, and it's noticed. You know, I, I noticed that. Oh, thanks, Larry. I appreciate that, man. Yeah. Well, yeah, we... Uh, all things must come to an end. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and so, Larry, thanks again. Thanks and, for having me. Yeah, it's my pleasure, man. Thanks for, I appreciate you coming on, man, taking the time to come on. Tell your wife I said hello. I most certainly will. Yeah. And hey, and, look, you know, we got um, V Weeks coming up. All that stuff is coming up, man. It's coming yeah. up. Oh, man. Hey, let me know. I want, hey, is some things happening in, in New York? Yeah. Yeah, what, what game? What games are here in New York? Um, you know, it, it, I'm drawing a blank right now, but it's good. There's um, there there's two great matchups that, that are happening that we haven't had before, and you know now we have uh, the Booyah event, so we have a big um, gala black tie event um, on that Monday for Stuart Scott. Okay, um, and it'll be the second one. Hill Harper, who you know, is yeah. the host, uh, and okay. Hill's coming back to host for year number two, um, and um, and it's just an amazing night. You know, and so maybe, uh, you know, maybe we start there, man. Okay. Yeah, that's awesome. So, again, we, uh, we, it's time to go. But um, <laughs> thank you to each and every one of you, each and every, every week that uh, you come on to uh, su support the Blueprint Podcast. Um, thank you. Um, I just saw Miss uh, Miss Brewington. Right. I saw my aunt up there. I saw my cousin Larry up there. I saw my mom up there. And my Joyce was the one that uh, Elder Daisy Ingram. My Joyce was the one that mentioned about the uh, young ladies that went to she knew that went to the to Oprah's show and won the cars. Man, thank you, guys. Appreciate you. Love you. Uh, thanks for your support. And as I say, each and every week. If God allows you to wake up tomorrow, make tomorrow your masterpiece. Love you and God bless you. We really hope you enjoyed this episode of Lowe's More, the Blueprint Podcast. Stay connected and follow us at our website, www.lowesmore.com. That's L-O-W-E-S-M-O-O-R-E.com. You can also join the discussion on Twitter at Lowe's Moore and on Facebook at Lowe's Moore Jr. As always, thank you for pushing your mindset towards a better reality. This concludes the most thought-provoking portion of your day. Don't forget to like and subscribe to this podcast to stay fully up to date with everything we're up to. Until next time, be kind to yourself and each other. With the kitchen, it's a joke. I ain't buying it like I'm broke. Insufficient funds for insignificant.